So you made the first scene of your game, and no lie, it's straight up rocking. You have your character running around on their little feetsies. There are countless items to choose from. A flawless inventory system, unless you know about the bugs. Fine, fine, we'll fix the bugs in this video. And now you have this great idea. Let's send our character into a dungeon. So we add a door, then some kick and beats so the player knows they're about to have their socks rocked. And we send our player to the next scene. And we send our player to the next scene. This video is going to assume you've already decided to use multiple scenes in your game. If however, you're still on the fence, feel free to pause and check out these pros and cons of using scenes. First, let's create our new scene. We can do this in our project properties. Also while we're there, we'll go ahead and rename our original scene to hometown. Then by clicking the plus sign, we can add a new scene, which we'll call dungeon one. It may look like our original scene has disappeared, but don't worry. Simply double click on both the scenes to add them to our navigation tab at the top of the screen. And now we have our new empty scene along with our original scene and all the events from the previous videos. We can see our new scenes event tab is blank, meaning no code has been added yet. But since dungeon one will be following the same rules as hometown, in terms of events, we can simply link the two together. This way, any events added to hometown will also apply to dungeon one. Next, let's go ahead and add our first objects to the new scene. Since we already have a player object in hometown, we can go ahead and share that object by setting it as a global object. This means the object, its behaviors, and default variables, along with other default values, will be transferred over. A pop-up is going to inform us that once we do this, it can't be reverted back to a scene object, which is perfectly fine. Now, viewing our global objects, we can see our player object is in our dungeon scene. And since my character object was originally a size of 16 by 17, when I drag it onto my new scene, it won't automatically have the same size as my object on the other scene, which we can quickly fix by setting the size. Now, hopefully you didn't find the process of setting our player object to global too annoying because we get to do this again for every object that we want in multiple scenes, which will pretty much be everything other than our grass object, since we'll want to make the dungeon a bit more dungeon-esque. And now we have our whole list of global objects to use on any scene. If you remember from earlier, when we created our scene, our player object didn't automatically come with us. However, we were able to create a new one and reset the values of the properties we found important. So what we need to decide is which item should follow us between scenes. Looking here, we have three different instances of our katana object. Is there a difference between the three blades in this scene? For starters, we have this blade lying in the grass, uncollected. If a player chooses to leave an item on the ground and move on to the next scene, we'll just assume it's not worth their time to collect, so it's not worth our time to track. And one of the great advantages of moving between scenes is the automatic cleanup of extra objects, which frees up memory and improves performance. So in short, we don't care about uncollected items. What we do care about are the collected items, which include both our inventory and equipment slots. And for these, we'll want to ensure the variable for equipped remains intact so that our equipped items stay equipped when we change scenes. We will also want to remember what stats each item had when we go from one scene to the next. So how do we go about tracking all these stats? Since we are moving between scenes, we will need a global variable to track these. And since we'll be moving so many different values at once, we're going to go ahead and use an array to track these values. The idea behind this is simple enough. Right before our scene change, we're going to want to take each object that we're interested in saving and grab all the values we want to store. In our current example, we have two katanas that we want to store. Let's grab all the equipped ones first. So we would go ahead and take the name of the object. This would allow us to create our new katana from object by name on our next scene. Next, we'll store the equipped value, followed by the attack stat value, the health value, the item type value, and finally, the X and Y position values. Next, we would grab the other katana and continue adding those straight to the same array. And for that, we would grab all of the same stats in the same exact order. Now, on our new scene, we simply go to the list and reverse engineer to create our items. Since we collected seven stats in total for each item, our code will repeat every seven steps. The first, we'll grab the name, the second, we'll grab the equip value, and so on and so forth, 
And then when we hit the eighth value, that'll be our new first. Again, grabbing the name value. Then the ninth would be the equip value. And repeating this until all of our items are added. Now, back to our actual game. Here, we're going to need to create two new global variables, one for items and one for item stackable. Both of these will be arrays. Next, we need a way to travel between scenes. Let's create a new object and call it door. This will serve as our collision trigger that initiates all of our new events. Now we can take a look at how the event sheet will work. Since there's a lot to cover, we'll go ahead and break it down one event at a time. We start our code off with a collision event between our player and the new door object. From here, we will clear any old values in our global arrays to make sure there's room for our current items. Next, just like in our example, we will examine each item one at a time. And we'll go ahead and add the necessary values, object name, x position, y position, attack, and health. Additionally, we'll want item type, but this one's a bit different. We'll need to decide if item type is worth grabbing, and we're only going to want it for items that are on the equipped layer, since these will be the items that are currently equipped. If they are, we'll go through each of the different equipment slots and check if our item is linked to that slot. If it is, we'll send over the corresponding name. And if our item is not on the equipped layer at all, we can just send over not equipped. We will then apply the same concept for our item stackable. Since these don't have stats or an item type, we can skip those checks, but they do have their own special variable, item count, which is actually attached to our inventory slot. So we can get that value by grabbing the nearest inv slot to our item stackable's x and y position and sending over item count. And now we're ready to move on to our next scene. In our new scene, the first thing we'll want to do is create the actual scene. Just like in our original scene, we'll need to set up our inventory, equipment slots, and ensure we have multiple layers matching our first scene. When creating the new scene, you can always just add the objects from your global objects and set their sizes as needed. Alternatively, it's much easier to just copy and paste from our first scene, keeping all of the properties the same on our new scene. And without adding any extra code, all of our mechanics are going to be up and running since we're taking the events from our first scene. And just a reminder, don't forget to set your groups as global as well as your objects, since we will be working with these groups in our new scene. Once the scene is all laid out and everything is working as it was in our original scene, we can add the events to load whatever items we stored in our arrays. At the beginning of our scene, we're going to set a global variable to zero. This will be our counter to iterate through our array. And don't worry about the transition code, it's just for an effect that I made, and it's not part of this video. Next, we are going to repeat our code for however many items we will be bringing over. So if our array has an index or size of 12, and each item has six variables that we are going to grab out, we could determine that we have two full items in there by dividing 12 by 6. To do this dynamically, we will take the child count of our items array and divide it by the number of variables we're checking for each item, which is 6. Now, we need to grab each of those six values. Remember that the order we stored our items variables was the item name, x position, y position, attack, health, and item type. So we will be using our counter, which is set to zero, representing the first spot of our array, holding our item's name. We will then create our object by name using the name from the first slot of our array. We can grab the next array's value by using our counter plus one and plus two to set the position. Then counter plus three and plus four will hold our attack and health values, which we will be setting next. Also, all the items we bring over are collected, so we can go ahead and set that value as well. Now we have everything except for our item type, which is held in our counter plus five position. This will have four different paths. If the value is not equipped, we will need to set the item in our inventory. It is already physically at that location from when we created it, but we still need to take the time to link and stick it to that location. Then if the value is weapon, this means our item was equipped to our weapon slot. Key things here are to set the item value equipped to true, make sure we move our item to the equipped layer, and also changing the weapon slot value full to true. And we'll do the exact same thing for our chest and our helmet. Lastly, in an empty condition, meaning this happens no matter which of our item type paths were taken, we will add six to our counter. 
This way, when we loop through the next time, we will be looking at indices 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, or our next item. Next on a parent level event, we will set the counter back to zero. This means we finished looping through all of our items, and we can begin looping through our items stackable. And these are going to be handled in the same fashion. While making this tutorial, I attempted to keep two copies of my code, one to build and test ahead of time, and one to show you all as I built. When it worked, it was great, but I also feel like I added some confusion with naming conventions changing randomly. All this to say, I am willing to give the zip file of my final tutorial and assets to anyone who asks for it in my Discord channel. The link will be pinned below. As always, a huge shout out to all my channel members. Thank you so much for supporting me. And finally, as promised, those fixes for the inventory bugs.